Good morning, everyone. I make that about 11.30, a good time to start, I think. Uh, welcome to In Search of a Perfect Cloud Native Developer Experience. So I do this talk at a bunch of conferences, from super techie to kind of agile and, and so project management, these kind of things. And I like to level set up front. I think for most of this audience, like we're going to be totally like down with this. But it's surprising at some developer conferences. I need to remind folks that the reason most of us are at the company or doing the work we do is to take an idea and deliver value to some users. Yeah? It may be sort of monetary value for the business, or it may just be quality of life if you're working for a charity, these kind of things. But in the kind of work that we all do, we typically write some form of software. If we can get away with solving a problem without writing software, even better. But most of us do write software to solve problems. Increasingly, we're delivering this kind of software, particularly web-driven software, via things like the cloud, like Kubernetes. Yeah? All good stuff. And I'm going to mention a few Kubernetes-specific tools, but I'll try and keep it high level-ish. Um, but the interesting thing I want to mainly talk about is this thing in the middle. We know there's a sort of outer dev loop you know, where we kind of iterate with our customers, we do project management. There's this whole, you know, pretty much what I love about Agile on the Beach. I've been coming here for like four more years now. I get to see the, be reminded of the bigger loop of the need for interacting with yeah, customers, planning our stuff correctly. But more perhaps akin to something like continuous delivery, more of the technical side of delivering value, this is where I'm going to sort of focus on today. And a lot of this talk is around platforms. And what, if you're deploying an application to you know, a web-based application, there is always a platform involved. If you're using something like Heroku, you know, that's the platform. Something like Cloud Foundry. These are classic platforms as a service. But even if you're not using those tools, even if you're just spinning up an Amazon EC2 instance, there is still an implicit form of platform. You're deploying your app onto something, and it is responsible for keeping that app kind of running, yeah? whether it's just plain Linux or whether it's these kind of fancy passes. We all recognize when it goes right, yeah? but we also all recognize when things go wrong. That tool you spin up doesn't quite work as intended. Anyone who's used the AWS GUI for doing like CloudWatch or security rules will totally recognize this kind of thing here, yeah? hours of frustration. And the worst thing you get is when you push stuff to prod and it simply falls over. I've seen teams recently that are used to classic you know, Java, WebSphere, Colo, on-premise kind of stuff, moving to the cloud. And they only test right at the last minute. They assume that all their, all their assumptions from, say, the WebSphere space are going to be valid in this new cloud space. And in my experience, the fabric is very different on-premises, colo, versus cloud, where everything's ephemeral. And there's different sort of primitives that like, built around, like, say, containers and pods. It's a whole new world, if I'm being honest. I made a bunch of mistakes when I got onto that kind of new, new world. So I like to call this thing in the middle developer experience. Yeah, and it's not, I've not made this up. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, for sure. I'll quote a few of them in a minute. But this is what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on the technical side of getting that delivery of value. This is me uh, at Daniel Bryant UK on most of the interwebs, like Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn. You can find me there. Uh, I've sort of had an interesting, I guess, background from an academic right through to um, doing like sort of CTO type stuff and a few startup things. Um, but I've my main kind of language has been sort of Java as a, as a development stack along the way. Um, and I've got more into ops, and then I got more into kind of like the, the technical leadership stuff. And uh, that gave me a great opportunity to learn many things and make many mistakes. So I love coming to conferences and sharing those kind of things. So you can make new mistakes. Yeah, you don't have to make my mistakes, is the idea. I have got a couple of books out. I know it's early, but they make lovely Christmas presents for yourself or your partner. So definitely, like, a good doorstop, if nothing else. Yeah? The job one is, is quite, quite thick. But I love your comments on, on those kind of things. So let's break down um, DevX 101. So we call this developer experience, like develop DX or, or DevX. Um, for me, it's kind of three key, oh, sorry, definition first, and then it's three key things. So I first bumped into this recently from Adrian Treneman. Uh, he's now at HBC. He was at Guild at the time. And he said, developer experience is all about reducing engineering friction between creating a hypothesis to delivering business value in production or an observable experiment. 
And we all are totally down with the experiments yeah, in terms of the agile world. But I have to explain that sometimes to, to folks. And it's really valuable to be able to get stuff into prod as fast as possible, and we're getting that feedback, getting that, getting that loop going on. Continuous delivery is fantastic, but you're always looking to get that feedback loop, optimizing. So it's, it's not new, this concept, but literally since we've been coding since, what, the 60s or 70s, like there's always been developer experience, even if it was literally Vim and a compiler. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. But it's become really popular. And I saw Steve Smith mention this yesterday, fantastic book. If you only take one book from this conference, it is Nicole Forsgren's work in Accelerate with uh, Jess Humble and Gene Kim. Awesome book, straight up. Not too thick, very understandable for all people, like engineers, right the way through to, to the management level. She pulls out four things that correlate with high-performing organizations. Lead time, deployment frequency, mean time to restore, and change a fail percentage. And for me, three of these things are primarily about developer experience. How fast from an idea to production, that's lead time. Deployment frequency, how fast can I put things out? And mean time to restore, I've got to understand what's going on when things are going wrong. That's all about DevX in my mind. Got to quote Martin Fowler, like I've spent so many times on his blog over the years, but his awesome article about the prerequisites to microservices talked about three prerequisites if you, to, to be this tall to ride microservices or, or so up, these kind of things. And again, two of them I think is around DevX. Basic monitoring, rapid app deployment. M monitoring for observability, understanding, rapid app development for getting value in front of users as fast as possible. Here's my three components that I was going to get to just a minute ago. The, I love books. Yeah, I used to have a long commute in London, so I, I read a lot of books. But for me, these are the three kind of inspirations between developer experience. And a lot of this won't be new to, I think, the Agile on the Beach audience. But the DevOps Handbook, fantastic book. It's all about the three ways. Optimizing for feedback and optimizing for continual learning and experimentation and getting this into the culture. Systems thinking. Lean is about minimizing waste. And when I first started going towards the cloud and using things like Docker and containers, I found there was a lot of waste where I was doing additional build steps. I was used to in Java doing a compilation, putting my jar somewhere, but now I had to do my Java compile, build a jar archive, put that in a Docker container, and then ship that somewhere. And that was a lot quite wasteful when I just wanted to code as fast as possible. And there's a fantastic book. If you haven't read this one, it's a fantastic book, yeah? And it talks about the need to intentionally design user experience. Now, we spend so much time on the user experience of our customer-facing apps, but we hardly spend any time, in my experience, on the tools we as engineers, we as QA, we as architects, we as PMs sometimes even, we don't spend much time investing on the UX of these tools, yeah? Um, now, I've seen many folks, and I've created them myself, like doing com quite complex CLI tools, but really bad interfaces, and we're using them like so much. Yeah? We really, I think it's well worth from an ops point of view, from a sysadmin point of view, having a read of these things and, and being a bit intentional how you create tools to support the code running in production observable. Moving on to workflows. So I started my career, lucky enough to say, several years ago, very much waterfall, working for the UK government. Uh, that was a lot of fun. They handed us this telephone directory of requirements. We opened it up, and we realized like, on page one, the design they put in, we couldn't do with HTML at the time. Like, it was all like, nice slanted columns and so forth. And back in 2003, I think it was, or 2002, like, HTML did not support that. So we were like, send it back. <laughs> and then, of course, we all know and love Agile. That kind of made it faster, improved the process. Now, for want of injecting another buzzword into the presentation, a bunch of folks are talking about things like full life cycle, and Netflix in particular, at the top there. Uh, I know we're not all Netflix. We're not all Google, obviously. But I do like to look at where they are, because I think the industry turns that way over a number of years. So like, it's a little glimpse of the future. And there's also this term around sort of full life cycle. It's more around fully autonomous, cross-functional teams. So I've seen a few talks here already about cross-functional teams. I've worked on several cross-functional teams, and I've had the most fun on those. We literally, all of us, could kind of you know, understand the business goals. We could map it through to code. We had support. We could bring in when necessary, like DBA support or kind of you know, platform support. But we were quite self-sufficient, and we, we knew the, the business goals we had, and we knew the levers we had to pull. And we were just like basically told to get on with our work, which is, was fantastic for me. 
There's a term called progressive delivery, which is increasingly popping up, and it's something um, I've chatted to the, the creator of the term, actually, James Rubmunk. I just bumped into him recently in uh, Amsterdam, but I've chatted to him several times before. And it, again, it's another bit of a buzzword, but it's taking sort of the continuous delivery principles, and Steve mentioned about that, optimizing for speed and optimizing for um, uh, resilience, so to speak, or stability, sorry, speed and stability. Uh, so that's the main goal of continuous delivery, is doing, getting you know, value to market fast, but stable in that it doesn't fall over or your systems can't be breached from a security perspective. Progressive delivery takes this one step further by being able to incrementally roll out things. Using things like feature flags, turning stuff on. If it doesn't work, turning it off. Using things like canary rollouts. And canarying is very common these days, even though we don't always realize it. A lot of big companies will release features to 1% of traffic. If it works from an ops point of view, and it works from a business point of view, as in it delivers more value, they then ramp up the traffic. So 1% of traffic, uh, live traffic is going through to this experiment. It all looks good. 10% of traffic is going through to the experiment. And ultimately, you might go to 100% of traffic, and then you deprecate the old service, you, you know, retire the old service. Now, there's some folks pushing back on some of this stuff and saying, this is just continuous delivery. What are you talking about, James? Which I thought was quite interesting as well. But the one thing I've noticed working with a few companies where they're trying to bring in things like feature flagging, being able to toggle on new features, toggle them off, being able to canary to understand, is this feature actually going to deliver value? And then if it does, you build more features on top of it. But one of the things I've spotted is you need platform support to actually do this kind of thing. You need to build in the canarying, build in the kind of feature flag tooling into your apps or your platform. I saw a fantastic talk last year by Stefan Tilkov from uh, InnoQ, and he talked about microservice patterns and anti-patterns. And we all know and love the patterns with microservices in that we can have autonomous cells working individually, hopefully loosely coupled, highly cohesive, all good stuff. But the anti-pattern is often you get micro-platforms popping up. So I worked on a project four years ago, I think it was, or five years ago, where we uh, had it was a Rails app. We were bringing in some Java for, my, for services, some other Ruby services, and some Go services. There was various reasons I won't get into why we were doing that. I do believe there were good reasons. You have to be careful with using multiple languages in a, in a stack. But there was, there was a, a strong drive in the company for doing this kind of thing. And people were fully on board. We had uh, expertise across these things. But we ended up in this kind of service-oriented architecture with a Go-specific service discovery mechanism, a Java service discovery mechanism, a Ruby service discovery mechanism. And then we did some things like circuit breaking and a bunch of other things. And there was always like libraries implemented that were language specific. It kind of is this anti-pattern of you have many things that do the same job written subtly differently. Yeah. So what we've kind of as an industry pushed more towards now, I think, is this notion of centralizing some of that functionality in the platform itself, or running what we're calling sidecars, things alongside your application. They're running out of process though that do a lot of this functionality that you need in a, in a kind of cloudy service-based um, system. You, you do need things like service discovery, like where is this service deployed, and things like that. You probably do need things like fault tolerance patterns, resilience, timeouts, bulkheads, these kind of things. There tends to be a, a nice pattern where you're kind of centralizing some of this functionality. You may even outsource this. It may be purely like you're using purely Amazon or Google or Azure's platform, but you probably have some kind of subject matter experts in-house. You know, Jane is really good at understanding how Azure works. Bob is really good at understanding how Google works, these kind of things. You have to remember that all these teams going around you know, doing their own thing in the edge, potentially, are at different stages of life cycle. So some folks are prototyping, some have got stuff in production, and some are doing mission critical things. And generally, the platform needs to support all these things because you know, we're constantly innovating with new ideas, but we've got these things that like, you know, people call them legacy or heritage, but like, they're, they're paying the bills, basically. Yeah? They are the things that are adding value. And you need to give people the tools to work with the products in the different life cycles. Like if you're prototyping and it falls over, eh, no biggie. But if it's a mission-critical system that falls over, you need to be able to fix it really quickly. So you need slightly different tools. 
There is an awesome gent called Kelsey Hightower, who I nearly quote in all my presentations. But um, what this one really was, I thought was quite good. And he says, I'm convinced that the majority of people managing infrastructure just want a platform as a service. The only requirement is it has to be built by them. I've totally seen this, I've totally done this, yeah? When I first started using Docker several years ago, we were like, oh, we need to have like, you know, our pipeline, we need to have service discovery, we need to do all these things. Before you knew it, we had a combination of Amazon, AWS, Docker, HashiCorp Console, a bunch of other stuff there, and we built our own little mini platform. We built like a Heroku, or we built a, you know, Cloud Foundry, these kind of things. And as a consultant, I saw this so many times in companies I was working with. And I think it's like only natural with engineers, we get a bit, you know, I get a bit excited with the shiny. You don't always look around the periphery of how much extra stuff you need to do to get the value out of these new shiny tools. Kelsey does make the point, though, and apologies if it's a bit small, but it says there's nothing wrong with building a platform. You know, you need a platform, yeah? Just know you're doing it. And a lot of my role, a lot, big part of my role when I was a consultant was making sure people were aware of the trade-offs they're making. Should you be adding value to the product, working closely with your customers, or should you be building a platform? The honest answer, most folks should be working with their customers, delivering value there. There's a whole lot of folks, particularly in big organizations, building platforms, literally building their own Amazon. AWS. I had a few folks said to me, we want to build a own AWS because we think we can do it better. And I was like, what? Amazon is incredible. You know, regardless of their, some of their conduct, as in like, the actual, uh, like, the, the, the technology they've got is, is fantastic. Yeah, and you find it hard to compete with Amazon, I think. So the question I'm really going to break down over the next like, 10 minutes or so is, should you build your own platform? Has anyone actually, like, and I hope this is a good analogy, has anyone bumped into this, should I build my own toaster thing? Yeah, a few folks. Fantastic. I love, I love TED Talks. If anyone like check out TED Talks, this is a really cool uh, TED Talk where the gent basically, I think it was like a, a university final year project, wanted to build a toaster from first principles. So he went and mined the iron ore to get like the, to build the plug. He went and kind of dug up like plastic from a refuge site and a bunch of other stuff. He literally made his own toaster, yeah. And it cost, I think, like uh, the, the the reference model he had was like an Argos toaster for three pounds ninety four. Uh, and obviously, he went to Argos and he bought it and he plugged it in, and it was good. This took him nine months to build, cost over a thousand pounds, and it lasted five seconds before it shorted out. But it is a fantastic journey about, like, kind of many, it's quite a philosophical one as well. But it's kind of the thing I see, like, in, in the industry, being a bit uh, flippant. And again, I've, I've done some of this, so I'm, you know, I'm just as bad kind of thing. But we really need to think about should we be building our own toaster? Should we be building our own platform? Yeah. Sometimes the answer is yes. So I've bumped into a couple of interesting use cases. Uh, one is Netflix on, on the left. I appreciate, again, we're not all Netflix. But the other one is Shopify. And they're quite a small company, actually. They're, they do like a shopping, uh, sort of shopping platforms as a service. So you can go to Shopify, buy a kind of shop from them, and they provide all the stuff for you. Nice web interface. You put your shop name in, put your products in. Great. Now, Netflix are famed for freedom and responsibility. And so basically, in Netflix, you can do pretty much whatever you like, but you are responsible. So if, you, if stuff breaks, your team, you're on call. You've got to fix it. But even they recognize that there is a need to centralize some of these things, because they had like 100 different variants of their platform. So they created what's called a paved road. They spun up a team that was working on a platform, and the idea being is if you wanted to deploy on this paved road and all the tools that came with it, they would support you. You're still on call, but they would help you if the platform went down, they'd spin it back up, and, and they'd also give you uh, kind of consulting uh, guidelines, consulting expertise as you were using their platform. You could totally go off platform, go out of the escape hatch, escape hatch and build your own thing. No one in Netflix is going to stop you doing that, but you're on your own. Yeah, if stuff goes wrong, your team is then on call and you have to fix it. So a whole bunch of folks moved over to this paved road because it gave them a lot of functionality that they wanted so they could just focus on building business value apps, just coding the stuff that delivered value to customers. <coughs> Excuse me. Nico on, on the right there, his team, uh, they were using Heroku, platform as a service. They really liked it, but Shopify was doing so well, it wasn't scaling. 
So they basically had this kind of awkward moment of the developers were loving the Heroku experience. It wasn't scaling. They had to build something underneath. And Nico worked really closely and his team with the developers to understand what they liked about Heroku. And it was basically the workflow was build stuff locally. You do like Heroku push master or git push master. And then the kind of the system takes uh, care of packaging the thing for you, spinning it up on a dyno, a dyno in, in the cloud and so forth. So Nico and his team built a platform on top of Kubernetes, but put a wrapper around it to make it look like Heroku. And I thought this was really interesting, yeah? And they, they were working on it, maybe they were going to expose the, the, sort of the Kubernetes um, primitives later on, but it was, it was a great way to keep the developer experience consistent, but allow the scaling. Yeah? And the key lesson I learned from Nico was he worked really closely with his development teams. The anti pattern I saw in a lot of organizations I went into as a consultant was that ops teams built a platform sometimes without even asking developers what they wanted. They just said, well, Amazon's good. I'll just copy what Amazon does. Or I'll build you know, something like Google. I'll build something like Azure. You really have to work with your customers. We all know this. But I think as engineers, we sometimes forget. And your customers aren't always the people outside the organization. Your customers are often in inside. So you really need to work understand what kind of needs your team has, like the monitoring needs, the logging needs. Like it's, and I wrote this up on InfoQ, so you can pop along to InfoQ and, and read. I learned so much from Nico about these things. So this was two examples where they, ans they a answered yes to should they build a platform, and they did it really well. And they're two very different scales, so I learned a bunch from, from these uh, people. So I've got about 20 minutes left, so I'm going to really now dive in a couple of different topics and, and ask, should I build a platform on something like Kubernetes? K8s there. Uh, just a level set, because I appreciate that not everyone might be super familiar with Kubernetes. Like, uh, I'm generally assuming that people are familiar with cloud-based technology, so AWS, Azure, Google. Are people generally familiar with that? I see a few nods. Awesome. People, are people familiar or using Kubernetes as well? Oh, is it more? excellent. excellent. Uh, if I was to check out a term like service mesh, like Istio, Envoy, are people familiar with that kind of stuff at all? I see less nods, but I see a few nods. Right, that's, that's good. That's, thank you very much. So some fundamental questions to ask in terms of should you spend time building a platform is do you understand your domain, is your problem domain complex, and do you have product market fit? If you answer no to any of those, I think keep it simple. And I like to say a monolith is awesome. If you really want to containerize it, like just chuck the monolith in a container and, and put it up on there. Like something like Heroku or something like um, App Engine is really good in Google. Like there is definitely places you should be spending your time if you don't have product market fit. Yeah. If your solution is event driven and really simple, uh, uh, perhaps you should be adding value elsewhere. I definitely think something like serverless is really popular, yeah, and, I, and with good reason. Uh, things like Lambda, there's a whole bunch of frameworks out there. They're kind of event-driven, very simple, well-defined platforms that the cloud providers are, are now giving us that just allow you to do the sort of proof-of-market stuff or proof-of-concept stuff really quite fast. And as I say, I'm, I'm a massive fan of App Engine. As a Java developer, App Engine gives you a kind of subset of Java. You literally write your code, gives you a bunch of nice tools locally to interact with things. And then I just package my app up in a jar, ship it across to App Engine, and Google handles all the operations stuff for me. They just give me a monitoring console, they give me a logging console, and I just do, like, I do my thing. Yeah, this is fantastic, yeah? I was at Continuous Lifecycle London about a month ago, and uh, if you haven't seen Matthew Skelton's work, I totally recommend. He's got some awesome books out there, brand new book with him and Manuel Pays just come out, well worth a, a quick web search from Man uh, Matthew Skelton. But I really liked this quote. He did a somewhat similar talk to me, and he said, I re uh, like, if you can get away with stitching a couple of AWS services together, then stick with that. And he called it the thinnest viable platform. We're all familiar with MVP, minimum viable product, or thin, thinnest viable platform. And again, I've seen many folks that have not adhered to this, and I've done it myself, yeah. So do think about these things. If you are going to go uh, sort of all into building a platform, I don't think you can go far wrong with something like Kubernetes, to be honest. Kubernetes has kind of won the war. There was a couple of, well, call them, it's not a war, of course, battle, sorry, um, uh, over dramatizing there. As in, there was, um, there was a bunch of frameworks that popped out, like Mesos and uh, a bunch of other ones. But Kubernetes, backed by Google, is a really popular framework. Every um, 
cloud provider, pretty much, even the small UK ones versus the big international ones. They all offer Kubernetes um, kind of as a service. You can literally say, uh, spin up like a Kubernetes cluster. And all Kubernetes does is it's good for managing your, your containers. But it's not really a full-scale platform. Lots of hosted options. You'll need to build some stuff on top. Definitely worth knowing the extension points, because a, a bunch of folks I've sort of um, initially, initially chatted to where they're exploring Kubernetes, they want to build on some extra things, they want to build on state management, they want to build on some extra tooling, and Kubernetes has been very much designed with that in mind. Yeah? But you need to know there's things called custom resources and controllers. Custom resources allow you to define a, an entity effectively in Kubernetes and some logic behind it. So developers can just write this custom entity defining things declaratively, and your code will then map that to actual stuff that's happening in the, in the cluster. Red Hat, uh, now IBM, I guess, but <laughs> Red Hat, did have this thing called operators. And operators are a really nice sort of formalized way of extending Kubernetes. There is an SDK, and there's also Operator Hub, which is kind of like a catalog, where you can pick things off the shelf and plug them into your cluster. So there's a MySQL operator, there's a Redis operator, there's a bunch of other operators. And the idea being is that they automate a lot of the human activity that would be necessary to run those products in something like Kubernetes, or in Kubernetes in this case. But it's a really nice way of encodifying human knowledge and stuff that we as humans don't really want to do because it's boring, or we're not very good at because it's very repetitive. There is extension points in, in Kubernetes that allow us to write this code that handles a lot of the automation of, of products, of things, of data stores, for example. Um, I think that's, yeah, so I've got a reference there. There's a nice blog from the Admiralty folk that talked about, actually, uh, and again, Nico, talked about why and how they'd extended Kubernetes to meet their needs, the developers' requirements around the workflow. There's a really, if, you, if you're looking inside of this space, there's a really interesting operator that provides a really nice example of how to extend a platform like Kubernetes called Flux. And Flux, all it is, is a continuous delivery operator that looks in a Git repo and synchronizes all the configuration in version control in Git to production. And you literally, there's, there's a sort of not very nicely explained here, because all Kubernetes config is in YAML, declarative YAML, but you can also specify a whole bunch of other stuff in YAML as well. And then you just literally do a git push, and then Flux will look at the repo and go, oh, stuff's changed, make sure it gets rolled out to production. Or if something in the cluster goes wrong, when it is like a control loop, it will sync back up and goes, well, hang on, the production is different than what I've got in this repo. I'll make sure I'll reinitialize that thing. So it's basically synchronizing our desired state with the actual state. And they've called it GitOps. You know, it's the kind of like term, like Git operations. It's just quite, quite interesting. Next question to ask, something I, I mentioned at the start of the talk and I definitely fell foul of, is how quick do you need that feedback? Yeah, so we're all used to kind of the inner dev loop of, I used to do a lot of Java, so I'd spin up something, I'd have hot reloads going on. So I was literally coding and like, getting feedback in my browser. I, I changed something, see it in my browser, and then only when I was happy with it, kind of it worked, did I then hand it off for a code review or, or you know, merging into the main branch, which is the outer loop kind of going on there. But when you're bringing in something like containers, which is a new packaging format, the, like courtesy of Microsoft here, the loop just gets kind of crazy big. Yeah, no longer was I doing hot reload in Java, like I had to package stuff in my Docker container, I had to ship that Docker container to a registry, I had to redeploy it. And unfortunately, one of the bad things with things like microservices is a lot of platforms I work on, a lot of apps I work on these days, like there's at least 10 things I have to spin up. Yeah, it used to be just the Java monolith, now there's like 10 microservices. And as much as I love Java, like there's no way I can run 10 Java apps on my laptop. Java is a little memory hungry, shall I say, yeah? I love it, but it, it is. Um, so then I've suddenly got to have some kind of remote cluster when I'm doing integration testing, and I want to like, link my laptop to that remote cluster. The, the loop is frustratingly slow when you're doing quite minor changes sometimes. Now, there is a bunch of tools that are coming out to solve this problem. It's, it's early days, and this is more of a kind of brain dump couple of slides where if you're interested into this space, uh, rather than reinvent your own thing, well worth having a look at what the community is doing. Shout out to Shahid, fantastic blog post on the left there, talking about some of the challenges with automating these kind of things in, in Kubernetes and, and, and the containers. And a shout out to Matt Farina. He talks a lot about the changing face of kind of operational tools. 
This is literally a brain dump slide for your reference later on. Oops, there is um, uh, some tools on the left that look at automating the kind of local dev experience. Tools on the right look at automating the packaging and deploying, and tool I actually work on called Telepresence uh, with DataWire. Um, I'll break that down more in a minute, but that's about connecting your laptop into a remote cluster. And we'll go through that in just a second. In fact, now. So I mentioned one challenge I've definitely seen is as folks do microservices in cloud, like there's definitely a sprawl. I'm not here to judge whether that sprawl is valid. I definitely see, and I've, I think I've been there as well. I went a bit microservice crazy. You know, rather than put code in the one app kind of thing, I spun up another service. Um, and that doesn't come for free. So then I, when I was doing integration testing, I suddenly had lots of services that I need to um, spin up somehow, and I, and I couldn't spin them up on my laptop. Now, what I recommend to folks is that clearly working locally has many advantages. If you've designed a service-based system well, you should be able to mock out many of your dependencies. You should be working locally, mock framework, something like service virtualization. You should mostly be just you know, doing TDD, nice fast loop. Uh, and you definitely, if you've got to spin up your whole environment just to like, do a really basic fix, there is something wrong with your architecture. It's probably highly coupled. So you need to fix that first. But what is, you know, some folks like, because um, it is obviously cheaper. If you're just like doing all your development locally, no need to spin up anything remotely. Nice and cheap, yeah, cost of the laptop. That's it. It does get to a point, though, when some systems are too big or you're relying on stuff that is only available in the cloud or only available in like, the, the data center or whatever. And then how do you do that kind of, you know, you want a fast-ish loop to iterate, but you, you are relying on this thing like that is remote, or many things often like in services. And there are tools popping up. So I work on one open source tool called Telepresence. There's also something called Squash by uh, Solo. And these are tools for injecting proxies into remote Kubernetes clusters and basically putting my laptop in the cluster. The proxy handles the two-way traffic. I'm developing as if I was literally in the Kubernetes cluster, which may be in Ireland, it may be in you know, Florida, San Francisco, wherever kind of thing. Fantastic talk by a friend of mine in London, Cesar, yeah, and, and the video's online, so you can check out the video for this. But I'll just walk through if it looks OK. Um, you imagine like you've got your app there, three services, A, B, and C. You've got a load balance at the top, and user traffic is coming in here. Yeah? Now, you, you might be saying you've got like a staging environment spun up with A, B, and C. You want to work on service B, but it's tightly coupled to A and C. So you, you need to do some proper testing. You kind of want to have things running remotely. Might be a data store in the mix or whatever. But you want to do some coding locally and see what changes. With, with a tool like Telepresence, it basically replaces service B with a proxy. And then I can develop locally as if I'm in the cluster. And any traffic that's coming in the top there going to B will actually get rerouted into my local machine. And I can step through debugging and so forth, and I can send the traffic back into the cluster. Quite a nice way to do that fast development loop. It's not without its flaws. We actually have some people doing this in production, believe it or not, which is pretty scary. Um, you need to be very careful to do that. We're actually doing some, working on some new tools to make that even easier. But um, it is a nice way of, of very quickly iterating on something that is kind of remote. So that's, I think that's pretty much wrapping up that slide there. Um, one thing I, I would just posit is more of a thinking point, a kind of discussion point, really. I'm definitely noticing a bunch of sort of different approaches to tooling. And I think like with Telepresence, we're very much sort of bringing the cloud to you. You know, we're like, I'm literally putting my laptop kind of in the cloud. But I'm working with like Amazon quite a bit and, and, and Red Hat and IBM and so forth. And they're increasingly pushing us to use dumb terminals, but do all our development in the cloud which I thought was kind of interesting. I'm not sure which I like best, to be honest. I kind of like my nice, powerful laptop. I like to be able to do stuff locally, but I see an increasing push towards actually coding online, like using online IDEs, like Clips G and a bunch of other IDEs. So just a thinking point there, as in, as you're making decisions about how to tool out your developer experience, like, if you look at sort of five years in the future, you might actually be using like a Chromebook or an iPad and doing all your development in the cloud, which comes with some interesting kind of dynamics, and interesting kind of changes. So that's more of a thinking point there. The final one I want to cover is, is how do you verify your system? So I'm sure many folks here are familiar with the testing pyramid. Love the testing pyramid, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs or, or the application of resources. Like we want to do probably more unit tests at the bottom here. We, we value everything in this pyramid, but we kind of like the things at the bottom is probably more of them. 
and they're probably more essential to get us started. Now, I've written more about this in my book, if you want to break it down a bit more. Um, this is a model. Like any models, it's kind of wrong, but useful. Yeah? And this model in particular, the testing pyramid, was sort of pre-microservices, pre-serverless, pre-server, all this kind of stuff. There's a really interesting lady uh, in San Francisco called Cindy Shridharan, uh, copy construct on Twitter. She's well worth a follow if you're on Twitter. She argued that the test pyramid is somewhat flawed and that we really need a test funnel now. And she is not arguing against pre-production testing. She's totally on board with that. Uh, and there's a bunch of like, really good points she makes. But she's saying that a lot of our systems now, because they're complex adaptive systems, there's only probabilistic guarantees of what you test sort of locally is going to be the same in production. Yeah, you know, Amazon might have a glitch, Azure might have a glitch, um, or just the sheer complexity of all your services interacting might not, you might not be able to verify locally what's going to happen in production. Yeah. Hence the need to do things like, uh, like the canarying, distributed tracing, uh, even things like chaos engineering are really popular, kind of causing failure and see what, seeing what happens. But I, I've really learned a lot from Cindy. I've, I've been very lucky to meet her at a couple, couple of conferences, and it really made me think about some of the tools that I've created with Teams to give us that ability to do things like canarying, to do, give us that um, ability to get fast feedback. As, uh, yeah, there is that probabilistic guarantee of correctness. Um, Moving on, I think I've got a shameless plug. So if you're interested more in the testing microservices things, I did a talk actually with a friend of mine called Abraham about testing Java microservices. So it's not just Java specific, there's a bunch of other things there. We talked a lot about how you segment a microservice system to make your testing as efficient as possible. So skills matter, kudos to them in London. I've got an awesome uh, website where all the videos are live, so you can check that one out as well. Um, so one thing that... Um, that Cindy talks about a lot is sort of um, the ability to canary and so forth. And I think, let me just check what I've got there. Um, just with time, I want to skip through a couple of things here. So I found canarying really useful, the ability to roll out 1% of traffic uh, to, to a new service, see if it's good, see if it works, see if I'm getting business value, and then um, like roll it back if it's not, or continue to roll it forward, put more traffic into the, into the production system if it's going well. There's a few gotchas here. Yeah? You need to be able to observe your system. You need to be able to understand what is going on, both from an operational level, things like SLIs, SLOs, but you also need to understand key business metrics. Are you adding to the bottom line or, or kind of taking away? You often need a high volume of traffic. If you're going to try and split 1% of your traffic off, but you only get 10 users a day, probably not much traffic going in there. And it needs to be quite sort of diverse to you test all the paths, basically. And you do need to take care with side effects. I saw a couple of classic projects. In the Java world, we have a lot of frameworks that will automatically upgrade your database schema, if you're changing your schema, like Flyway and things like that, Liquibase. Um, I saw one person, or a couple of folks, uh, they rolled out canary versions of their application that changed the schema of the database. So what happened is it got deployed into production. The framework recognized that the schema was out of date, so it updated the database schema, and of course, then only the canary worked. All the existing production systems were referencing an old schema, and as soon as the schema changed, they all fell over. So 1% of traffic was working, 99% of traffic was going through to broken services. So yeah, be careful with that one. It's, it's not as, as, as obvious as it might first seem <laughs> on that one. In terms of observability, focus on the golden signals. So you know, things like latency, traffic, errors, and saturation, you should totally have as like a, a kind of no-brainer on, on some dashboards. It's totally OK to look at the dashboards. I see some folks trying to automate some of this too aggressively. Only thing I think you need to automate is actionable alerts when things are going wrong. So set your thresholds, and then you know, use um, whatever tool you're going to use to like, page you or to email you and so forth. But you, you, like, for the sort of canarying, it's OK just to look, I think, uh, first off. You can try and automate later on. Around the, um, the high uh, volume of traffic, if you don't have high volumes of traffic, you can load test. Uh, so you can make fake data, fake requests going in. Typically, you want to have a header in there to uh, tell your production systems to ignore, or your staging environment to ignore this traffic. It is just a load test traffic. And you can even do things like synthetic transactions, which are purely fake kind of traffic going in. Uh, with the side effects, yeah, some um, things I've, I've done is uh, we've tried to do like no ops, so we have different profiles in the app. So if we're going through with a certain header, a database writes, we'll just do a no op. 
for example, it would just like, won't write any data. We also use things like service virtualization. Like, I worked on a tool called Hoverfly a few years ago, and that basically is a lightweight copy of a service. So you can record data in and out, so that it's kind of pre-canned data, so that you don't actually call the real service, you call this fake version, this virtual version of the service, and then the side effects are negated because that's just the kind of fake version of the service sitting alongside your app. Bunch of techniques there. Canarying is super useful, um, but it comes with a few caveats, and your platform needs to support it. One, I mentioned about sort of being, uh, thinking about the UX. Uh, as an engineer, I really, I really like the kind of, these kind of dashboards, you know, your nuclear power plant dashboards. But the reality is, when you're trying to roll out like, code and understand what's going on, you want to make it as simple as possible. Focus on the things that are important to your business, the core metrics kind of thing, and you know, keep the launch super easy, yes or no. I think it's yeah, definitely tempting as engineers to want to go super fancy on the observability stuff, but if you can't get instant value from your dashboard, it's probably too complicated. Right, let me just wrap up on these things now. So I mentioned about sort of upfront around this kind of need to have multiple teams going at different paces. Excuse me. Some kind of perhaps infrastructure support in the middle there. It might be Azure offering that support, Amazon, Google. You might have your own in-house team, these things. Um, but this, this, I found, is quite a nice model of scaling kind of platform working. And, and the people in the middle kind of can consult with the people at the, at the edge. Some thoughts on where to focus, depending on where your teams are in the kind of life cycle. If they're prototyping, I think you want to like, locally develop as much as possible. Potentially, you want to use tools like Telepresence, I mentioned, where you've got some remote cluster and you're doing kind of like proxying into the cluster. Um, if for releasing, if you haven't got many customers, canarying is great because even if it goes wrong, no one's really affected. Like in terms of guide rails, kind of like uh, sort of putting people more towards the correct way of doing things, I've jokingly said it's kind of YOLO here, as in when you're prototyping, you don't really want to worry about putting too many complicated guide rails on what people can and cannot do in the platform. You really want to focus on that inner dev loop. Uh, when a lot of folks move from classic development to cloud development, like developers, we get really kind of concerned about the speed of our dev loop because we're suddenly packaging things in containers, doing all these things. So really try to minimize that pain and focus on things like creating a delivery pipeline. If you're a bit further along on the journey, so you've got production, you've got customers, you're making money off this stuff, I think then things like um, having some kind of hybrid system where you're using things like locally developing, got a remote cluster, in combination with like, local um, work as well is quite valuable. Definitely want to, like, canarying is really valuable, drip feeding that traffic into production, but you want to invest a lot more in pre-production testing here as well. Because you've got real users, you want to make sure anything you do push out is, um, is solid. Limited guide rails, I would totally recommend uh, focusing at this stage on observability and codifying best practices. So one uh, team I, work, I worked with a few years ago, we um, used Yeoman, which is kind of like a generator, an automatic boilerplate code generator, and we had a bunch of best practices like um, linking up to our CD system, linking up to our observability system. And we had, um, we used uh, like a fair, like something like Jenkins, it was at the time, like a CI tool, where I could go into Jenkins, I could type the name of a service in a box, press a button, and it would literally create a, a version control repo with my service with all the scaffolding code in there. So it was a Java service, it used something called Maven archetypes. It would literally, I'd type in Daniel service, press a button, a few minutes later, ping, I'd, go, I'd be sent a Git um, repo link, and then it would be like a framework, a basic kind of um, scaffolding. It already had it linked up to the monitoring, had it linked up to um, the alerting and a bunch of things, and I just added my business logic on top, did a Git push, and it kind of got compiled into the system. So we codified the best practices. If you're mission critical, this is where you want to invest even more in things like um, pre-production testing, local development as much as possible. We do see some folks I've worked with uh, are using sort of um, multiple development clusters in staging, and they're having their developers using things like Telepresence and Squash to connect up to those remote clusters for integration testing. But you want to invest in more strong guide rails here, so it's harder to like, do bad things uh, in the platform, such as delete databases and, and all that kind of stuff. Observability is a strong thing to focus on here. Um, debugging and being able to recreate stuff. I find a lot of challenges when folks go into the cloud, when stuff goes wrong, they've got these quite complicated systems and it's really hard to understand what's going on. 
And if you use production to understand what's going on, it can get worse quite often. So having the ability to clone a data store or clone parts of your infrastructure, clone you know, just a few services that you know are affected, to be able to put somewhere else and you can play with them, I found is really valuable. And there is some of the tools I mentioned earlier on do allow you to do this kind of thing, and if you clone on demand. Uh, so I totally recommend being able to clone your environment and your data. Do be careful with cloning data, particularly like with GDPR, PCI, DSS. Uh, bumped into a few challenges with that. Cloning production data is potentially challenging, but I do recommend it's a good thing to do. Right, coming pretty much to the final furlong now. This is the final slide. Uh, in summary, I, you know, developer experience for me is about main, sort of minimizing that friction. Particularly when you move to the cloud, a whole bunch of new stuff comes in, many benefits, many pain points. And we really, as engineers, we're all just there to deliver observable kind of experiments, deliver business value. How you construct your platform massively impacts developer experience. And as I can speak from experience, I don't think we spend enough time thinking about this. We as engineers, and um, we just build these tools to help us without really understanding the user experience and, you know, and these things. And if you intentionally curate your experience of things like local development, uh, the continuous delivery, observability and stuff, it makes it much easier, particularly when you've got that success in the market and suddenly you, know, you need to be reacting to customers even quicker, there's production incidents. If you haven't baked some of this stuff in early on, it's a fine balance, but it can really cause pain later on. At that moment, I think we're perfect time for lunch. I'm not going to stop you getting in the way at lunch. I'll take questions like at lunch or hanging around or whatever, but I'll say thanks for your time. <laughs>